I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance, to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie meditation. When the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. And so goes the great short story by Edgar Allan Poe from 1842 entitled The Mask of the Red Death. Poe's short story is, to put it mildly, a bleak account of our own mortality. The Red Death is a fictional plague that threatens to render a community extinct. And so a wealthy prince named Prospero decides to avoid the plague, cheating death by throwing an opulent party in his palace up on a hill. Through seven colorful rooms, the guests danced the night away, partying like it's 1799. <laughs> and there is no threat of the plague reaching inside their walls. This time I'm not going to spoil the ending as I'm apt to do, but the passage I just read describes the chilling moments that pervade the party when the grandfather clock in the seventh room chimes on a new hour. Party pauses, the people are confused. Perhaps they are reminded of their mortality briefly, perhaps reminded of the real world outside their doors. Then the music resumes and they become complacent and they move back into reverie. And if this sounds painfully like the planet Earth in these last two weeks, then maybe you can see how we are all in danger of becoming the party revelers, complacent in our situation avoiding the confrontation that the world clamors for. For that is also exactly, exactly the situation in Luke's Gospel today, where one of the most significant moments in the whole narrative has occurred, Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. And so begins his long journey to that great city where he and we know how this will play out. The stakes are now higher. The bell of the clock is ticking now, and Jesus knows precisely what that means for him. This reckoning helps explain the bristling tone of his words and emblemize in those words, let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus' attitude has made a critical pivot at this point in Luke, realizing now that the balance of his ministry will be a journey to the cross. The name of the game now is endurance. Endurance through faith, endurance of all that is broken in this world and that all that broken world will assault him with. But knowing that the kingdom of God and the love of God transcends all of that pain. Two weeks have passed since the hate crime in Orlando, the worst mass shooting in the history of this country fact that is worth repeating over and over. Anyone who has suffered a loss, close death, knows all too well that it is about this time, following a trauma, that people start to forget, start to turn the page, start to resume the revelry. It is inevitable that America will do the same. Already, the gun debates the mental health debates are all dissipating. The plight of the LGBT community receding into the back pages of the paper. The LGBT community a generation ago survived its own red plague. And now the joys of recent years, equal rights, marriage equality, have been set back. And this sad reminder that hate, hate equipped with a semi-automatic weapon 
still threatens to squash the liveliness of an entire minority. Debates about guns and terrorism, mental health, and human sexuality will continue. But as Christians, we should take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, how broken is this world? And more importantly, where can we witness to the love of God amidst all of this? Because the clock is tolling, and we are like the disciples around Jesus who face an endurance test and a reckoning in the days and years ahead for the soul of this country and this world. And we say we are ready to follow Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem, but we really want to pause and say, just let me grab a few things for the trip first. Jesus says, no, not this time. Let the dead bury their dead is harsh, but it is part of his bigger point. There is no time for this. The stakes are too great. Either you are coming or you aren't. Now, doom and gloom is not the point of this sermon today, but instead a clarion call from Jesus through Luke's gospel to all of us. Be an emblem of that love of God which transcends debates, transcends hate, transcends fear of the other, and yes, transcends disagreements with our sisters and brothers. Because our soul as a human people is at stake. An interesting debate in seminary was one that actually goes back a few years, which is centered around this question. Is the church a reflection of our culture? Or is it a respite from our culture? In other words, is it in fact counterculture? The reality is probably quite nuanced. But today, with the situation post Orlando, situation of Trump v. Clinton, situation post Brexit, the economy in a tailspin, situation about mistrust and fear, well, maybe then, at least today, Yes, the church is counter to all of that. But the church, this church, our church, is not a party thrown by Prince Prospero that ignores the culture wars outside these walls, but instead seeks to be an agent of change from the inside out. If that counterculture movement is about love and peace and understanding and being guided by the Spirit, as Paul implores us, then it is a counterculture movement. It is indeed a Jesus movement, as our presiding bishop asks us to think of it. And it will always be outwardly minded to take these seeds of hope and go out these doors and work to counter the culture when it poisons God's created order. Guided by the Holy Spirit in all things, Luke's Gospel account today Taken together with all of the other horrible events humans have inflicted on each other and the world outside these walls, and all the fear that abounds that we must counter to, all of this draws me to a great quote from another late 19th century figure, labor organizer Ellen Harris, frequently known as Mother Jones, who famously said, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. Speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.